Welcome to the Ghost of Parent Hall. My name's Simon. And I'm McKelly. Thank you for joining us for episode 118 of our chapter by chapter book review of A Song of Ice and Fire by George Martin. Today we'll be discussing chapter 44 of A Clash of Kings. That's Tyrion 10. And the plan, as always, is to chat about the chapter, try not to spoil any future plot points for you, and hopefully provide you some entertainment along the way. We'll summarise what happened, discuss our thoughts on it, provide some useful background, compare it to the television show, indulge in a little pedantry, and cover some reader mail. Be sure to check out the show notes, they'll help you if you're not reading along. They'll help you if you are reading along, but they'll help you even more if you're not reading along. <laughs> How are you, sir? I'm doing okay. You know, I, I think I've decided that I should probably call you Simon Silvertongue for this whole episode. Mm. <laughs> yes, that's funny, actually. I keep blanking on his name, that character. <laughs> it is, it is, it's weird. <laughs> but, but simultaneously, I've been off on the Discord server, like, you know, sort of like chitty chatty with everyone. <laughs> I think that should be your uh, new Discord server handle is name. Simon Silverton. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Of course, a yeah, whole he's... bunch of uh, inappropriate jokes could be made about that <laughs> name. But uh, well played. As uh, we yes, keep this I, um... PG-13, I won't bring any of them up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, uh... Yes, I, I I have no recollection of him as a character, so I don't know if he's going to stick around or not because he's he's in this chapter, but I, ca- right. I can't tell. It, his his fate is very much in the balance at the end of this chapter, so he could be very short lived or actually could stick around because because basically his fate either goes to an immediate end or right. to actually he'll be in quite a few chapters because he's going to be kept around. Right. I do remember how it goes, but I will not to tell you unless you want me to. No, no, I don't want. I don't want. Okay. I, I, I love the mystery. Right. Um, it's weird for us to spoil our own show before we start. <laughs> <laughs> it's one way to open. We've done 117 of these. we got to mix it up. <laughs> now, not to ruin it for you, but we're going to be talking about Tyrion Tet. And this is what happens. <laughs> Uh, do you know, so I just dropped Molly off at swim practice. That's why we're starting a little late here tonight. And, um, do you know, I was flipping through to ri- the radio stations and I heard Christmas music. And we are only a week into November and already Christmas music on the radio. And you know me, I I go all out for such things, but not on November 8th. Even for me, that's too early. You see, the weird thing is, this is a this is an interesting American rest of the world difference, because obviously um, the corporations of this world would like to extend the Christmas period because there's money to be made, right? Right. Yes. So of some of it is that. Some of it is like, oh, we'd like to get the Christmas music going a little bit early, kind of thing, you know. And then some people are lunatics and they want Christmas music, you know, for four months of the year, you know. Right. But in the United States, you have a very significant holiday. A month out from Christmas, right? Which the Almost rest of the exactly. world does not have. So you actually have like a dividing line. The holiday the rest of the season, world has n- right? The rest of the world has nothing to stop Christmas from <laughs> spreading into September. Because <laughs> yeah. it is Christmas right, joy it, for all to hear, like Elf. <laughs> right? Yeah. In America, it is strange to hear Christmas music before Thanksgiving because you've right. got Thanksgiving. But the rest of the world, I mean, like you know, late September, especially in England. <laughs> Especially in Northern Europe, where, like, you know, the nights are getting colder and darker by that point. Sure. It actually feels kind of Christmassy, you know. They're already uh, rocking God Rest You Merry Gentlemen in uh, (laughs) mid-October. You you know what I discovered today, McKelly? I discovered we had a new uh, listener join the Discord server from Australia. And she was saying she's just just binged, listened to the whole thing, and she's up to date now. But she was saying that we don't drop in Australia till Tuesday. Oh, I saw that. Oh, that is. That's. that's that I don't know how you get through Monday, really. I know. Like we, we're, we're supposed to be what gets you through Monday. Right. Yeah. We might uh, have to. I don't know. Do something for the Australians. You know, sort of right. like a, sort of like uncut version with our stuttering. <laughs> and... <laughs> oh man! With how late I get started editing, it would be quite uncut. I think. I think yesterday, because we're recording on a Monday. Uh, I think yesterday I finished. Re- editing at about 8 p.m so mm-hmm. i gave myself about a three hour window there <laughs> four hour yeah. i guess yeah. about about an hour before you started that you you emailed me to say you know what those show notes look an awful lot like the last show notes <laughs> <laughs> i was like yeah that's because they're just a copy 
I've I've learned to to, to check that because you write in there the correct uh, episode title, but then yeah, if, you, yeah. if you look down, no, <laughs> the info not. is not. <laughs> so. Yeah, I'm I'm aware of what has happened when that happens. So, um, what have I got for you? I feel like I've got something for you. I'm sure you do. You you lead such an interesting and varied life. Uh, I really don't. <laughs> oh, update on my tennis. My tennis is getting very excited. You know, remember my tennis? We play to we play a hundred and one matches. You right. Know, and we play to, so the first of fifty one wins wins yep. that mega match. The current score in our second mega match is 4140. Wow. Oh, You're coming down really to it too. It is. It is. <laughs> I won the first one 5140 uh, 5142, so I need to I really need to put the hammer down if I'm going to match that this time. Are you currently the 41 or the 40? Would I be telling you this if I was losing, McKelly? Solid point. Yeah. Solid point. Yeah. I should have <laughs> I shouldn't have even needed to ask that. <laughs> All right. Let us get down to business. How did we leave Tyrion Lannister? Last time we saw Tyrion, it wasn't very long ago, was it? It was like three chapters ago. Yeah. Um, We're on Tyrion 10 in chapter yeah. 44. 44, so. <laughs> yeah. It's, he's, he's a big part of this book. Yeah. Last time we saw him, he was saying adieu to his niece, Marcella, as she sailed away to her new life in Dawn via everywhere in the whole world. <laughs> he was part of the royal party that was then attacked in the streets by hungry citizens. He learned from Head of the Gold Cloaks, Jessalyn Bywater, that the people blame Tyrion for their woes. And with Varys and Bran, he came dangerously close to discussing regicide. McKelly, why don't we give him the summary of this one? Okay. I'm going to get my editing work in here because I've only read the summary once this morning. We, we put this particular show together in what, this is, a day? This is a new record. This is a new record. We turned this one around. Because it only occurred to me, like, probably like six hours after we recorded the last one, that we really had to record this one today, like 24 hours later. So we had to both like feverishly read the chapter and then get all this stuff together. So if it sounds a little unpolished and perhaps shorter, <laughs> that's or, or longer, actually. I mean, yeah. that's, that's one of the things, you, especially with you. <laughs> you definitely start with a long and we sort of like trim it down. Yeah. Yes, yes, I do. I do. I'll fill the notes out pretty uh, thoroughly. <laughs> but we have the gift of gab. I'm sure we'll we'll make a, yeah. a fairly decent dent into this. I, do I look worried? Do I look worried? <laughs> you do not. No one else can see him but me, but he does not look worried. Anyway, here comes the summary. Lancel informs Tyrion that Cersei wants to get Tommen out of King's Landing. The plan is to disguise the prince as the son of a hedge knight and have him squire at Rosby with Lord Giles Rosby. It's close to King's Landing, just to the northeast in the Crownlands. Tyrion doesn't want to derail this plan. He actually agrees with it. But he wants Tommen under the care of men loyal to him, not the Queen. He sends Bronn with a written message to Sir Jaslyn Bywater of the Gold Cloaks. The written message instructs him to go down the Rose Road. However, Bronn is to give Bywater the real message, which is to ignore the letter and to instead intercept Tommen's party and continue on to Rosby. No killing in front of Tommen, no harm to before Lord Giles. And when he gets there, Bywater should replace the garrison with his own men, but otherwise stick to the plan. For this, Bywater will receive a lordship. Meanwhile, Tyrion heads to Shay, riskily skipping the ruse of Shatiah's brothel. The citywide curfew making him feel like he couldn't be followed without his knowledge. Tyrion is annoyed by the presence of a singer when he gets there, particularly when the singer recognizes him. Word cannot get out of his relationship with Shay, but Shay doesn't want the singer harmed. Tyrion agrees that the singer can stay on in her household. That's Simon Silvertongue. That's Simon Silvertongue. Uh -huh. But you see how his life hangs in the balance right yes. now. I mean, he might become a, a regular in the book. He might be for the chop. Tyrion dismisses the singer, but th is then disturbed so that he can have alone time with Shay. Right. But it then is disturbed again, this time by Varys in disguise. Shay sees straight through the disguise. In her profession, it pays to see the man under the clothes. Wait, that... Came out wrong. <laughs> you you know what I mean. <laughs> it does literally pay to see the <laughs> Varys' news is that Sir Courtney Penrose has killed himself. 
jumped from the walls of Storm End, Storm's End. The castle has fallen, and Stannis may well soon be headed to King's Landing. Tyrion is furious. Tyrion intends to cut short his visit. He sends Varys to the stables while he and Shay say their goodbyes. She wants to become his legit woman, but he was expressly forbidden from bringing her to King's Landing, so he cannot. She is in real danger, so Tyrion wants her to come into the Red Keep as a kitchen scallion. She is... Um, that, that word is scullion. That, scullion, uh, The word yes. you've got there is a green onion. <laughs> she, just, she just stands in the pantry pretending to be a leek. <laughs> Make was, your hair tufty and wear was, your green dress. I was writing quickly. <laughs> I did say scallion too. <laughs> But he was expressly forbidden from bringing her to King's Landing, so he cannot. She is in real danger, so Tyrion wants her to come into the Red Keep as a kitchen scullion. She is not happy. They argue. She asks if he's afraid of being spanked by his father. He slaps her. She is cold from then on. The story of his marriage to Tysha comes spilling out of his mouth, but it doesn't change her mood. Eventually, she submits to his will. He leaves and heads back with Varys. Varys agrees to help bring Shane to the castle, but offers a better route. Lady Tanda's maidservant is stealing from her, and Varys could have her removed any time and replaced with Shay. Mm-hmm. The job would be easy. Lollis never goes out of her apartment since the rape. And furthermore, Varys knows of secret passages that Shay could use to enter the Tower of the Hand unseen. Tyrion is agog that such passages exist. Varys and Tyrion discuss Penrose's death. The details point to something very strange, but Tyrion is a skeptic. Varys confesses the story of how he became a eunuch. A sorcerer of some sort cut him and burned his genitalia on a fire. At that point, he heard a voice in the flames, and no amount of fear or agony nor the passage of time have ever shaken Varys' belief that it was real magic. Try as he might. But his belief in magic is not acceptance. He despises it. And if he were to believe that Stannis was dabbling in it, he'd kill him. Tyrion is horrified and expresses pity for Varys, but he's still dubious about Sir Courtney's demise. An assassin might have achieved the same ends without magic. But Varys throws in the confusing and uncertain accounts of Renly's death as further evidence that Stannis, or someone close to Stannis, is dabbling in the dark arts. Tyrion's more concerned with the news that Stannis is coming, while Tywin is still bogged down with Robb Stark, and no other help appears imminent. The inhabitants of King's Landing, who by and large despise Tyrion, have no one else to turn to. Okay. So, um, I, I actually do think perhaps it's time for a, uh, some outtakes, because I really enjoyed that one. That one. Yes, up. there was quite a few. If it, if it hits the cutting cutting room floor, let me tell you, McKelly called uh, Shea a scallion. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll leave that in there just because it was so funny. <laughs> so after the fireworks of the last Tyrion chapter, which was really, I mean, if you remember that one, that was the Marcello one, and then the uh, ride through King's Landing and the you know, rioting, and... death and mayhem. Yeah. yeah. This one, this one's relatively lackluster, I think. It um, is, but it, interestingly, it starts with the same theme: basically, Cersei's children being sort of absconded out of King's Landing to keep them safe. Right. Last time it was Marcella actually heading out, and this time it's a plan to get Tommen out. Right. Yeah. Um, and uh, Tyrion asks uh, Lancel, who's the one that's giving him this information, "Is it the mob she fears or me?" And Lancel says, "Well, both." It's a uh, they're they're referring to Tyrion's deal with the Martells for the betrothal of uh, Marcella, and so she must be fearing that Tyrion might pull the same deal with uh, not not to uh, betroth Tommen to Tristan Martell, but a no. similar deal with uh, really you can only do that once, I right? Yeah, with uh, Prince Tommen, and you would think I mean he might fetch an even better deal because he's currently the heir to the iron throne true enough true so enough. Uh, if he could make a match that would work for an alliance he very well just might go and do that 
But of course, she's actually doing the same thing. I mean, she's she's sending her child away. I mean, that's that's what she was afraid Tyrion might do, and she's doing it herself. She is sending him to Rosby, which is about is about as close to King's Landing as you possibly can send someone <laughs> yes. without still being in King's Landing. And she's basically just she wants sending to him out the gate. Flea bottom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. So Lancel's doing what he's asked, been asked to do. He's providing useful intel for this. He's now he's getting kind of demanding because he realizes that he's actually being useful to Tyrion. So he's, he he wants command in the forthcoming battle with Stannis, um, one of the flanks. But I mean, just Lancel, you're a dingbat. I mean, like it's the last <laughs> thing you should be asking for. This battle is not going to go your way. I mean, or it might, but it's going to be a lot of death involved. I yes, feel. I agree. It, I'm wondering if he will be wielding his dreaded wine skin. And on the battlefield, <laughs> See, Here, have a sip. not going to work on Stannis. <laughs> it's no, work it's on not. It worked on Robert, but not Stannis. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, one brother, not the other. Yeah, I'm thinking that wineskin might be as about as lethal as a uh, Lightbringer. So you know, he might go out there with it, and <laughs> score people in the Actually, eye, blind them. <laughs> the, the two of them together, <laughs> the wineskin and Lightbringer, <laughs> could be really dangerous. Um, so. Tommen, Tommen being hidden as a squire with his hair darkened, like I said, Rosby's very close. I don't think it's a good enough uh, ruse because if you, if Stannis storms King's Landing and takes it, okay, right, yeah. he beheads Joffrey and then he's like, where's Tommen? And so you'd spread out from King's Landing looking for Tommen, right? The first place you'd come to is Rosby. Yes. <laughs> and then I sort of imagine the, who's this kid? Oh, well, he arrived a few weeks ago with that Kingsguard fella and 50 gold cloaks. <laughs> <laughs> I hear he's the son of a hedge knight, you know. <laughs> the gig is up for Tommen there and then, I feel. <laughs> yeah. Yep. <laughs> just might be. That, that just might be enough clues to put together. Right. right. <laughs> but what they'll he has do. Got dark hair. Wait a minute. That rubs off. <laughs> <laughs> what they'll do is he'll. They'll bring him back and, and see if Melisandre can see in the flames whether or not this is Tommen or actually the son of a hedge knight. <laughs> yeah, but I do wonder, now that you, we are thinking about that particular situation, if if that all came to pass and Stannis had Tommen, had killed Joffrey and, Marcel, uh, Joffrey and Cersei and Tyrion, all the Lannisters in King's Landing, Probably Lancel would die on the battlefield before that even came to pass. Mm -hmm. Um, Would he kill sweet little Tommen or would he just make him bend the knee? Okay, I'll go with um, the litmus test, if you will, of that particular decision is Edric Storm. What is his plan for Edric Storm? Right. Because if he kills Edric Storm, because now... His conscience, Sir Courtney Penrose, has taken the uh, plunge from the walls. Right. Um, then, yes, Tommen's definitely dead. But if he actually is going to look after his nephew, Edric, and sort of help him and give him a lordship or whatever, then, yeah, why not? I mean, Tommen's got a claim to the throne. But I think people, if Stannis wins the throne, with time, people will say, you know what, those Lannister children were not. Right, Baratheons. because history is written by the the victors. Winners. Yeah, exactly. the victors. Right. Yeah. And I mean, how many friends are the Lannisters going to have once they get the the reason that Lannisters have any friends is because they're in charge right now. Yeah. Right. So I don't I don't imagine a groundswell. I mean, compare that to Daenerys. I mean, Daenerys, she could have a groundswell of people supporting her. Admittedly, her own father was an atrocious leader, but some of the Targaryens were good leaders. So right. she could have. There isn't a single example of a recent good Lannister leader. <laughs> you know, Joffrey is what they've got, you know. Right. <laughs> Over one. <laughs> right. Who, who's going to rally around Tommen, you know, no matter how sweet he appears. You know? Yeah, yeah, that's true. Now, that um, Pycelle did say that he he is the one that suggested to Ares Targaryen to let... Uh, the Lannisters in during the sack of King's Landing because he thought that Tywin was going to ascend to the throne and he thought Tywin would be a good la- uh, leader because he was such a good hand of the king. So I guess there's, yeah. there's that. But the current, the first Lannister king has not gone over very smoothly. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah. But also, I mean, Tywin, 
Tywin has done a lot of evil in the realm in the last few oh, months. Yeah. Uh, yes. There's sure no has. one from the Riverlands is going to support Tywin. There's no oh, yeah. one from the North going to support Tywin. Right. Absolutely. But, you know, so Tyrion is surprised that he didn't know about this plan and about this the plan, plan. The, the Tommen plan. And he's, he thinks to himself, either Varys didn't know about it or he's up, he's playing a longer game and didn't tell Tyrion that this was coming. And I got to say, I find it hard to imagine that Cersei could put together a plan that Varys wouldn't be aware of. Yeah. But the one thing about this particular plan is, I mean, like, her plan of recruiting sellswords, she had to talk to people. Right. You know, yeah. This particular plan is just her, whichever, did, did, did they name which one of the Kingsguard is supposed to go with him? No. The only thing they said yeah. is, uh, Bronn said, well, it won't be the Hound because he's Joffrey's right. yes. dog. That's and right. the Gold Cloaks can handle whoever else they send. Yeah. Um. And then presumably some handpicked soldiers of her own. So she, I mean, and almost none of them need any prior notice, you know? You tell them yeah. on the morning, Tommen's going to Rusby, you know? Yeah, I guess so. I guess so. It just seems like Varys always knows everything. So it's yeah, weird. Yeah, I guess you would have to talk this. to Giles Rusby, and that, yeah. you could, that, that is where the handover of information could get intercepted in some way. True. Um, but so... Uh, Tyrion, they're talking in a sep, Lancel and Tyrion. And um, after Lancel delivers this news and leaves, uh, Tyrion lights a candle at the warrior's altar for Jaime, which makes sense because, he, as Tyrion says, he's one of yours, so protect him. But then he lights a candle for himself with the stranger, which is not a very busy altar. People <sighs> tend to steer clear of that particular altar. and. Uh, if you remember, we did a background on it. I think it might have been the episode, the cat praying, not the cat, <laughs> our cat <laughs> praying uh, at the Sept episode uh, where Renly was killed. And outcasts are the most frequent flyers at the stranger's altar. So I guess maybe he does consider himself to be an outcast and so gravitates I think the other the thing is he, he senses that war is coming to King's Landing and maybe he's like... Here's a candle instead of me. <laughs> <laughs> Could be. <laughs> we know Cat in that chapter. Cat thought she'd find no comfort with the stranger, so she right. she said a prayer to all of the others except for that one. So I just found it interesting that he lit a candle for himself at the stranger's altar, which most people yeah. tend to avoid. But but yeah, I mean, I think you're right. I mean, the the outcast thing is definitely. Definitely how he perceives himself, I think. Yeah. So, uh, the message that Tyrion Reed sends to uh, Jocelyn Bywater is in code. Well, it's not really in code. It's it's just, don't do what the message says. Bronn is the person carrying the actual message. The the uh, Bronn is sent with the note. The note says, take 50 of your best swords and scout the Rose Road. Bronn says, why are we sending that message? No one's coming down the Rose Road, you know, that Stannis is going to be coming up the King's Road. And he's like, yeah, but that's not what I want them to do. What I want you to tell Jaslyn Bywater is to go to Rusby and intercept Tommen and take him on and yada right. yada. Yeah, it's basically just, um, he's just covering his tracks, kind of. Should uh, that letter fall into someone else's hands? Yes. It, it, if it said, hey, go take Tommen on the Rosby Road. That might be a little bit incriminating. So yes, whereas it's it seems unlikely you could torture anything out of Bronn, and frankly, why would you try? Right. Yeah. Yeah. He's carrying a letter and he can't read. Right. <laughs> <laughs> now the the Rose Road runs southwest from King's Landing into the Reach. It's the road that Littlefinger would have traveled on to get to Bitterbridge. So, yeah, and me, then it continues on from there to. Uh, to the high the, yeah, right. Yes. Right. And meanwhile, the King's Road runs directly from King's Landing to Storm's End. So Bronn right. is right. If they're going to travel a road, they're not going to go a circuitous route over to the Rose Road unless they went over there to pick up troops at Bitter Bridge. But Good we, point. Good as point. we learn yep. in this chapter, there's much chaos going on at Bitter Bridge. Yep. So. Uh, but I, I think the, uh, the, ultimately what he's trying to do here... Tyrion's trying to put his men in control of Tommen, 
whereas the Rosby guards would be loyal to Joffrey and Cersei. I mean, that that seems yeah pretty obvious, I guess. Yeah, but but then the question is, when all this comes goes down, because you assume this is going to go down, that right. like, he's going to send a large enough force to um, overwhelm Tommen's uh, protectors. Is Cersei going to find out? It feels like she must. Sir Giles Rusby going to send her a note that tells her that this has not quite gone the way she expects it? Is she going to be okay with it? Because the basics of the plan are still in place. Tommen's in Rusby, protected and hidden. Right. So I don't know that she'd find out immediately. Because if the Gold Cloaks do take control, they probably won't let any ravens go out from Rosby to King's Landing. But this is a big thing to keep quiet for a long time, you know. So at some right. point, it's probably going to come out what's happened. And then you just got to wonder, even more animosity toward Tyrion from Cersei. And we know uh, she's known for retaliation when she's threatened. Just ask Ned Stark about that. Yeah. So. And, and actually, if you think about it, if you if you... I don't know if Sir Giles has been in King's Landing, but if you had a chance to talk to Sir Giles, what I would say to Sir... If I was Cersei, I would say to Sir Giles... Lord. Tommen's... You keep calling him Sir Giles, but he's Lord Giles. He... Lord Giles. <laughs> what I would say to Lord Giles is, when Tommen is safely in Rosby, I want you to send me a raven that says... And then some kind of coded message. Right. And not only a coded message, but also... A specific word that says everything went to plan. If that word is present, everything went to plan. Right. And if anything doesn't go to, if he gets there safely, send me the same coded message without that word. You know. Yes. Yes. Uh, that that's probably something um, that uh, Tyrion. Because would then, what does Justin Bywater do? Because Justin right. Bywater, if, you, if Rosby says I'm supposed to send a raven once he gets here, yeah. then you can read the note all you want and and say it has to be coded. This is the code that she'll understand he's safe. You know. Yes, right. That's a I've, that's a very good plan. You I've should... I've read I've read literature before. I, I, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> I, I I could be quite the spy. <laughs> um. So, um, he is he the 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 letter doesn't offer it, but the but the verbal message from Bron offers Lord Jess, uh, Sir Jasmine by water. I'm mixing up my lords and sirs, a lordship. <laughs> For doing this. Right. And he Bron will be Lord Bywater. Like take... Then he would be Lord, yes. Bronn offers to bounce Tommen on his own knee for a lordship. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a, a funny image right there. Yes, it is. <laughs> it's it To me, the whole thing seems a bit odd, though. I mean, like, Bywater has been loyal to Tyrion since he was appointed. I mean, and steadfast, he would do exactly what Tyrion asked him to do. Right. Yeah, well, what's... Uh, my, my only... My only thought as to why he might need to sweeten the pot is he hi, he, he put J- Jocelyn Bywater in place because he knew he was an honorable, trustworthy man. And maybe this feels dishonorable to be hijacking because, a Because, right, because he's, but, yeah, I guess so. I guess so. You're right, though. It is, it is odd that someone who has been doing everything he's asked without need of dangling a carrot in front of him he would dangle such a big carrot in front of him right here but that was the only reason i could think of that he yeah might because need to... because it is turning on people who are loyal to the crown right yes which he's not previously been asked to do he's been asked to be loyal to Tyrion, but Tyrion's been acting in the best interest of the crown now he's clearly doing something against cersei right Doing and it. recruiting Jasmine Bywater to do it. Yeah. Throwing Jaina Slint into the uh, the ship that's going to the Night's Watch does not exactly fly in the face of the King and Queen Regent. This directly flies in the face of the King and Queen Regent. So right, yeah, for sure. But it's also so not think... clear if yeah, go on. Yeah, it's not clear if Bywater is made the new Lord of Rosby, but the conversation sort of suggests it because. Bronn says, what should the new lord do with the old one? Now, that's not necessarily saying he's the new lord of Rosby versus the old lord, Giles Rosby, but it certainly suggests that. Mm. But Tyrion does say not to kill Lord Giles, right? Yes, yes, he does say that. So, yeah. 
So uh, it was just yeah, a little I bit thought confusing. of it. I, I assumed the lordship would be somewhere else. I, I didn't really think it, but but I take your point. There was an implication, that, at least from Bronn, who just may not have understood. You know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So then the sort of next scene is Tyrion goes off to see Shay and he throws caution to the wind because the curfew's been extended, uh, which was happened after the riot that uh, killed the High Septon and uh, several others. Right. <laughs> I thought it funny because he said that, well, his, his internal uh, conversation says that uh, the council extended the uh, curfew and i was like the council it by my count it's cersei varus and Tyrion that's only left in the council right now in town right pycelle pycelle's not allowed to be on the council that was part of the deal for getting him out of the black cells is he couldn't be on the council anymore oh i'd lost i lost thread of the track of that one completely how interesting i think it's just cersei and Varys and Tyrion, <laughs> so it's not quite That's much, a good of a, point. much of a council anymore. <laughs> but because of the because of the curfew, deaths are down, and that's that's good. Deaths are uh, are, are down at uh, in the morning. There's less uh, body, less corpses. I think is how Tyrion puts it. And, and then, of course, Varys says that the people curse Tyrion for this curfew, and. He's in a he's in a tough spot without some sort of mass public relations campaign here. Yeah. But it's hard. I mean, PR is a very modern thing. Right. Yes. You you can certainly do a better job than Cersei does, and Tyrion could benefit from it because he's getting blamed for things that aren't his doing. Right. Know? So that that's definitely when you would actually want some PR, but yeah. It it certainly be hard to get the word out to half a million people living in king's landing you know you could have town criers out at every square yeah, yeah. but hear ye, hear ye. i'm not the bad guy <laughs> right <laughs> so when Tyrion gets to shays directly um the singer simon silvertongue annoys Tyrion, and he confesses that all singers annoy him <laughs> <laughs> was that because of uh Mer- was he merillion merillion probably who... didn't yeah. help probably didn't help yes. his opinion <laughs> yes but um this one doesn't even have the wit to pretend he doesn't recognize Tyrion, which, of course, would have been smart. Right. I have to say, I didn't really think of it. When when Simon Silvertongue reacts to Tyrion's entrance by saying, oh, it's Tyrion Lannister kind of thing, I, I thought that was entirely natural. And Tyrion blamed him for not having the wit to pretend he didn't know who Tyrion was. Because then at least Tyrion might have been inclined to let him go because if he pretended not to know who Tyrion was, there was the chance he might not know who Tyrion was, right. and therefore he could have walked off into the night. Yes. But as it is, the last thing Tyrion wants is people, a guy who goes, frequents taverns, going into said tavern and saying, you know that big house over there? Yeah, right. With the pretty lady in it? You know who I saw there the other day? Yeah, it's definitely a concern. I mean, yeah. Singers are known to tell tales. It's kind of what they do, so... Yeah. But you could also easily see him going to Cersei for a price, depending on if he but, knows any that there's any sort of animosity between the siblings. The more likely is he just brags what he knows right. for a cup of wine to someone who does know that Cersei would pay for that piece of information. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah you're right. But the whole thing was seemed rather avoidable. He knew when he was outside that the singer was in there so why did not just have the Ebony's guardsman who was who was there uh, yeah. just make that guy leave, and make him go out the side entrance or out through the back door or something, you know? So yeah. So the the stupid one in this actual situation was Tyrion, right. not Simon. Unless it is possible that the singer knew who Shay was ahead of time, you know, it's possible she mentioned it, but you wouldn't think that she would. You'd hope not. I mean, she's a little blasé about her safety, but you know who I am? (laughs) (laughs) I'm mistress to the hand of the king. Don't tell the queen. (laughs) We'll be right back. Hello, friends. Are you ready to make some unforgettable memories? Well, if so, consider the Marriott Bonvoy program. Discover the perfect destination for your summer getaway and unlock exclusive deals on luxurious accommodations. With our affiliate partnership, you'll enjoy unbeatable savings and a seamless booking experience. 
Don't let summer slip away. Visit Marriott Bonvoy today and make this vacation season one for the books. Use our Ghosts of Heron Hall affiliate page to check it all out and buy Bonvoy points or give some as a gift. The link to our page is in the show notes. So, yeah, I mean, what you've been saying all along about old Simon Silvertongue is right. What does he do with the singer now? That's Yeah. But Shay does not want him killed. Shay, right. Shay recognizes the danger to Simon Silvertongue and, and begs Tyrion not to kill him. And Tyrion, I think, basically acquiesces. It seems like he's not going to do anything to him. At least directly. to her face, he says that. Well, you know. true. Yeah. He could, uh, Simon Silvertongue could have a, a, you know, an accident and fall into a pot of brown or something. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Which, I mean, in the current circumstances would be very welcome by the pot owner. <laughs> yeah, probably would. <laughs> <laughs> we got meat, people. We've got meat. <laughs> Soylent green. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, after Varys arrives and the, he, uh, Tyrion learns the news about Penrose's death, uh, Tyrion decides that it's no longer safe for uh, Shay to stay in the manse. And actually, he mentions that during the riot that, uh, that followed the sort of during the sort of general melee that followed the riot from the ride through town in the last Tyrion chapter, several or at least one particular uh, rich person's manse was burned down by right. rioters. So it's not safe just generally, not, not just the fact of who she is, but just generally it's not safe for her to be out here. Right, especially at a nice um, house like this. And it, we, right, exactly. we discussed that exact thing when uh, Tyrion sent Shaga to guard her during the riots because, it's so, because of its close proximity to Flea Bottom. So and right. he says to her, this is, he, he's going through like, you know, they killed Aaron Santagar and they raped Lully Stokeworth and they killed the High Septon. And this is an even bigger boon if they discovered the hand's lady was here and she says, the hand's whore, you mean. And th- and yeah. then she makes a case for being his lady. And so she says, you know, I could be your lady, though. I could dress in the beautiful things that you get me and I could hold your hand at feasts and I could give you sons. And it certainly looks like she's hoping to do a little social climbing here to move from the hands well, whore as she puts it to the hands lady to be honest her career does not have a long lifespan sure yeah. it would be good to gravitate towards something like a ladyship at this point that would probably be a wise career move even she's only like 19 or 20 or something but still right yeah you know i think maybe if Tyrion hadn't had the experience that he'd already had with taisha it he might be enticed he might be able to be enticed into agreeing to something like that. Uh, I, I, I think, I think, but for the absolute admonition of his father to not do this, he would do it. Yeah, I yeah. think he's completely in love with Shay and wants to make her happy. I think he just fears that if he does that, what befell Taisha will befall Shay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's that is that. That's his argument. Is I was strictly told not to bring you to court. And uh, here right. you are, so I certainly can't be prancing around with you in the the Red right. Keep. So, right, but, and of course, if you just said that to someone, they might be like, "Well, what's the worst that could happen?" Well, here's the story of my first wife. Right, know? here's what could happen. Right, yeah, and it, and and it's not just a theoretical. This is the same cast of characters. <laughs> right, <laughs> <laughs> this is a solid point. Yeah, this is not what would happen. This is not what could happen. This is what will happen. Right, and she's not taking the threat very seriously though, and she keeps trying to arouse him, and it makes it reminds him of Dancy, and Dancy was the the redheaded prostitute at Chitaya's brothel that kept flirting with him heavily before Aliyaya got to him because she was trying to win a bet that she could uh, seduce him. Uh, yeah, so that's the yeah. dancy that he was referring to there. Yeah. So then, troubling moment of the chapter, Tyrion slaps Shay across the face when she draws the... Uh, when she specifically says, are you afraid of your father spanking you? And... Uh, I did wondered about that. I wondered his his reaction to that. Obviously, she was annoying him, but Tyrion seems a little bit more level headed than you know. He's not the Hound, you know. Right. Um, 
I wonder if that partly is is a fa- sort of because of his stature, the insecurities of being small. That image that she created of him bent over his father's knee getting spanked would be terribly humiliating for him, given his stature. Sure, yeah, it'd be like spanking a, a you know, like like he's a child. Well, she says so you're right. He think you're but, a child if, or something. Right, but if if Jamie were th- given the same image, he would just go. Pfft. That's ridiculous, you know, but right. Tyrion could imagine it and like feels the yeah. shame of it. Yeah, so his, yeah. His confidence and cockiness feels like, you know, he's still got these insecurities about how people find him laughable. Oh, certainly. Certainly. He mentions at the end of this chapter that he's the whatever they call him, the evil devil monkey or something like that. Right. And, uh, so he certainly has he's certainly aware that those kind of things are still being said about him. But I I agree that that's a very solid possibility, but but also I feel like he this conversation is is starting to show uh, that this relationship that Shay and Tyrion have going on is becoming really tricky to keep up because his mind is really split between rational Tyrion mind and the fantasy that he's trying to uphold here. He he even thinks in his head. Uh, at one point that my love for you shames me enough. And and then after he tells the Taisha story, he thinks, how could I tell her and think that she will, how could I tell her that about Taisha and think that she still love me? And then his very next thought is, you stupid dwarf, only gold and jewels. It's only the gold and jewels that the whore loves. So uh, I was thinking maybe the mocking nature of that statement kind of disrupts the whole story that he's trying to feed himself, that she loves and worships him, and that she is secretly laughing at him too, and that uh, causes him to snap momentarily. Yeah. I do I do wonder, though, I do wonder about his, you know, I mean, he blurts out the Taisha story to her in sort of like, as a sort of penance for the slap. Right. But I mean, he doesn't come out of the Taisha story that badly. No. I mean, I mean, he... He he looks like a, an abused child, basically, right. is yes. what he comes out of that. Yes, uh, I, mean, I agree. I didn't think when he was so ashamed of having told her, I thought, aside from the fact that he did have sex with her at the end, that, you know. That, right, but he was made to. He was not, you know. Yes, absolutely. He was a child. He was like in his early teens or mid-teens yeah, yeah. or something. So, yes, I, I think he he doesn't come off nearly as bad as he probably thinks that he is. We'll be right back. This episode is sponsored by Audible. To get a free audiobook, or two if you're an Amazon Prime member, go to our exclusive URL, audibletrial.com slash ghostsherrenhall. You can find the link in our show notes. But yeah, I mean, you make a good point, because I mean, we don't have Shay's POV, we have Tyrion's, and he's madly in love with Shay. Right. Shay may just be an entirely mercenary prostitute who just wants the money. It's very possible that that's the case. She it's, is. It, it's, she's very good at acting the way she needs to act. If she is not that, yes, but then maybe that's the point. Maybe she's very good at it. It's possible she could truly have feelings for him, but it's also very possible that she is yeah. riding this golden ticket for as long as she can. Yeah, it is. She is hard to read in this part because, of course, she sort of go, she goes into sort of like a a silent lockdown after getting getting the slap. Um, it is possible she definitely thinks less of Tyrion now for both the story of Taisha and the slap. But um, yeah, it's hard to read. Um, I, I agree. I, I've I've it, I think the description was intentionally written to be hard to read because Tyrion doesn't give us any insight. He can't really read it either. And yeah. I was thinking maybe that. A wide-eyed look that she has that he can't read is her realizing that what happened to Taisha could be her fate, which makes her goal of being a lady of Lannister pretty near impossible. Right. And maybe she should aim somewhere else. Right. Because right. Because at at this point, possibly she's you know making steps in her mind toward a life of courtly parties and lordly children and. You know, Jaslyn Bywater is about to be made a lord, so that's uh... right. Yes, there's lordships in the air. <laughs> mm-hmm. Interesting, but but I 
I would like to point out to her, what, the one thing that doesn't seem to cross her mind, but again, she's hard to read, is the reason he chose that moment to blurt that out was because he's warning her, this is what my father will do. This is what my right. father will do. I'm not trying to hide you because I'm ashamed of you. It's because I fear for your life if I reveal you, you know? Yes, absolutely. It, if she, you know, if she thought about it that way, it certainly makes an awful lot of sense. But that yeah. she says um, that she doesn't fear Cersei. And he says, well, I do. And then yeah. Shay says, well, you should kill her and be done with it. You don't, you two don't have any uh, love between the two of you anyway. And Tyrion points out something that is pretty obvious, but maybe if you're not thinking about it, you don't realize that that all of his power comes from the fact that he is a Lannister. And he mentions that although he doesn't necessarily care that all that much for Cersei, his brother and his father hold her dear. And yeah. if he crosses them and kills Cersei... He's a nobody, you know? He he loses right. everything he has that gives him his power and authority. Yeah. So. At, at this point, Tyrion mentions that his elbow hurts. I, mean, I don't even remember that. Was that at the Battle of the... On the Green Fork. Uh, Green Fork. Yes. It, was, it was, I think it was the last fight with the knight that he ends up oh. killing because the he more... puts his spiked helmet into the gut of the horse and it falls the on the knight. And yeah. I believe he hurts his elbow in that particular battle. Yeah. But yes, that's what that's what he's referring to. So it's a solid plan to bring Shane to the Red Keep. I mean, obviously she'd be safer there, but a kitchen servant is pretty rough. Varys paints a very ugly picture of what her life would be like as a kitchen servant, you know, right. being preyed upon by the male servants, and uh, you know, she'd be she'd be beaten down by the job. You know, she right. really is beneath her. Yes, it, it, that's one thing I was wondering because she is vehemently opposed to the idea, and I wondered if it was uh, afraid of life in the kitchens, like we were. You were just saying that you know she's going to be molested and people are going to you know try and sneak into her bed at night, or is she? She also mentions her fear of the physical toll it'll take on her, where her hands will will get cracked and red. And, you know, uh, just the general wear and tear of the work. And she's thinking, well, Tyrion could discard me at any day. And then right. I've got to go back to my day job. Right. And it sure would help if I'm as young and pretty as I am right now, if I have to go back to that life. Yeah. But she says that her father made her his kitchen wench. And that's why she ran off. And Tyrion says, wait, you told me he made you his whore. And that's why you ran off. And she's like, oh, well, yeah, it was both. I didn't I didn't like either of those things. And I thought, you know, both could certainly be true. Or possibly did she has she made up a backstory for the character she's playing as uh, Tyrion's girlfriend that she that she thought would elicit a response that she wanted from him. Yeah, but I mean, let's be honest. I mean, your typical prostitute in Westeros, is not going to have a very fun and nice backstory. Oh, yes. So, absolutely. Yes. Her, her made-up backstory is probably fairly close to the truth. As close to the truth as she wants it to be. You know? Right. Yes, that's very, very true. But Varys's idea of instead making her Lollis's maidservant is great. It's safe. It's not taxing. Easier access to one another. Right. Out of... Out of sight, out of mind from Cersei, because she's got no interest in the t in the stock Stackworth. Stokeworth, yeah. Stokeworth, sorry. Yeah, and then Varys says something like, do you trust me? And he says, I trust you like one of my own blood, in truth. And I was like, wow, mm -hmm. that's damning him with faint praise right yeah, there. <laughs> that is, yeah. <laughs> and I wouldn't be lost on Varys, I feel. Right. Oh my God. <laughs> when have I lied to you? <laughs> So they discussed Penrose's death. There were guards in the room. I thought the guards were outside the room. I think they were outside the room. Yes. Right. They, there were guards outside the room. Uh, there was nobody in there before or after. So that means suicide or something magical, it seems. Right. Uh, and Varys points out that he didn't sound very suicidal that morning when he was tongue lashing Stannis and his retinue. Yeah. Um, we Of course, we know what happened. But if we didn't know what happened, we might have thought that Davis's... Uh, argument could possibly be right where he said maybe 
he was Courtney Penrose was offering uh, this trial by combat as a way to get out of this situation, even though he knew it was going to cause cost him his life. So, yeah, 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 yeah. That he didn't want to bring the suffering down on the people of Storm's End. Right. And at the same time, he didn't want to go back on his word. So he thought, well, I'll do a trial by combat. I'll lose. And then it'll be done with. But we, of course, know that there was a shadow. It would be quite the coincidence if they unleashed a shadow monster into the tower at the same time that Courtney Penrose was jumping to his death. That would be... uh It'd be funny if the guards broke in and the shadow monster was like, not me, <laughs> not me, already gone. <laughs> I, I came in, it was like this. <laughs> but uh, Tyrion suggests that possibly it was the faceless men as an alternative to the, the magic that uh, Varys is proposing might have uh, been the cause of Courtney Penrose's death. Do our listeners know who the Faceless Men are? They do a bit because he, the Faceless Men were also proposed as a possibility um, to kill Danny when uh, uh-huh. when King Robert wanted her dead at that council meeting. And I think it was Littlefinger said the Faceless Men are way too expensive for the task at hand. And uh, But they're a group of assassins in Essos. So it certainly makes more... It's a more logical option. Like if you were trying to look at it from what are our logical possibilities, it's certainly a more logical option than there was a shadow assassin that right, yeah, yeah, killed her. Him. So, but but this all makes Varys smell magic. You know, he he smells magic. Um, Tyrion remains more skeptical. So Varys confesses then why he is a believer in magic. His story is awful. It, it elicits sympathy even from Tyrion and. The full story goes that he was part of a mummer's troop that toured the cities that ring the narrow sea, and one day his master sold him to a sorcerer. He was drugged to be helpless, but not insensate. He was then castrated and his genitals thrown into a fire, and at that point a voice spoke from the flames. The sorcerer left him to die, but he became an adept thief, graduating from stealing purses to secrets. So uh, you can see why he would hate magic, but you could also see why he would believe in it. Right. Now, before Tyrion can counter any of his story, he says, and believe me, I recognize the fact that under the duress that I was under, I might have imagined something. He said, right. but I keep thinking about it and something, there was something there more than just my fear and my agony. Good way to put I it. I heard something. Yeah. Yes. Right, right, um, right. So you can understand why if Stannis is doing that, this, he is... Uh, Varys is not going to be a friend of Stannis. Yeah, and we've talked about this, I think, uh, the past few times that we've um, talked about Stannis, is that, you know, taking King's Landing is his first challenge, but his next biggest challenge might be dealing with the faith and those who follow the faith of the Seven that he's trying to bring this new religion in. And, I mean, you can ask Aenys Targaryen how well it goes to fight against the faith of the Seven, especially... If you don't have a dragon to quiet the opposition. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, of course, only Varys thinks there's a magical explanation for this. I mean, like everything else, Brienne of Tarth has been like labeled as the murderer of Renly. Right. Cat Courtney thinks something, Penrose, uh, something happened, but true. Uh, Courtney Penrose threw himself off to, you know, to end the siege, whatever. Right. So, you know, as long as he doesn't keep doing it, going back to this well, as long as he wins King's Landing by, you know, with his flaming sword, <laughs> then he doesn't really have a problem. Apart from the fact he does, he is going to want to change the sort of de facto religion of the of the land. That's what I'm getting at, yes. The death of the High Septon might work in his favour. Oh, good point. Yes, that's a good point. Do, do you totally buy Varys' story? I mean, it's not completely implausible. I mean, he obviously is a eunuch and was at some point not a eunuch. So there must have been something that led to that. Uh, it felt heartfelt as he was describing it, but Varys is the master of whispers, you know? Yeah, and also an accomplished actor. So, you know... Oh, good point. <laughs> making up and selling a story would not be outside of his wheelhouse. And right. has anyone checked to confirm that he is a eunuch? Could this be a story? story that he's been making up he he just is Not currently <laughs> he's currently portraying a begging brother very convincingly could he also mm-hmm. on the daily be uh, pretending to be a eunuch i i honestly don't know I, off the top of my head i can't think if there's 
been any proof that's ever been mentioned. Yeah. I'd have to look into that. Yeah, interesting. Um, but he all... I, I think he has he has a high voice, right? I don't know. That's a good question. No, he doesn't. I don't. I believe I believe we've heard before that Varys has a high voice. Now that could be if you're castrated pre pubescence, you would have your voice wouldn't break. Yeah, he was a boy. I don't know what level of puberty he had reached by that point, but right. but but we also see, so... like you mentioned, he's the master of whispers. We see the start of this career right here because. He becomes a thief after, uh, you know, after this whole incident. And he mentions that the contents, he discovered that the contents of letters are more valuable than the contents of one's purse. And right. so began his career in trading and acquiring secrets. And Yeah. Uh, so assuming his story is true, I, I wonder now, we've had a few examples of magic in uh, the book. They always seem to have sort of a price to be paid in pain or blood or body parts or lives in fact um, right yes yeah with with the possible exception of stannis who only seems to be losing sleep right we haven't seen what aside from the stress and sleep that he's losing we haven't seen him sacrifice any person or but, but, gen- but genitalia Right. Maybe he is sacrificing something that we're unaware of, you know. Right. Or, or perhaps, I mean, given that she's pregnant, perhaps it's a, a seed sort right. of thing that yeah. he has to okay. donate. Sure, sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, so one thing they mentioned at this point was that there's no word from Littlefinger. Um, Where he, did he remember go? he went off to Bitterbridge to talk to uh, Sir Lord. the Tyrells, yeah. right? Right. Um, and it's not been heard of since. Yeah, and uh, to make matters worse, uh, Varys tells Tyrion that uh, there's been no word from his father and that the fear is that Tywin's army is going to get trapped between his foes, which we know that is exactly the North's and the Riverlands' plan, is to trap him between his foes. You have to imagine if Varys can pick up on it, that Tywin is aware that that's a possibility as well and make some sort of plan. But, but... But then Varys goes on to say that the oak heart leaf and the rowan tree have been seen north of the mander. And those are both reach houses. So what okay. are they doing north of the mander? It doesn't specifically say they're in the Riverlands, but the Riverlands are north of the mander. So could he? Could they possibly be meeting with Tywin himself or parlaying with Rob? Or possibly has Littlefinger been successful and they're riding to help Tywin? Hmm, interesting. Yeah, because he doesn't go on. All he says is the Oakheart leaf, which is House Oakheart, and the Rowan tree, House Rowan, have been seen north of the Mander. So we'll have to keep an yeah. eye on that. Yep. And the other news he provides is that the Tarleys, uh, uh, Sam Tarley's father, uh, Rand- Randall, Randall, Randall yep. Tarley, uh, is putting a great many to the sword, mostly Florence. Uh, basically, he sees what the, the Florence has turned coats for switching from Renly to uh, Stannis. But again, Renly is dead. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but Randall Tarley, we know he's inflexible. Yeah. He's, you see, he and Stannis would be great buddies. <laughs> <laughs> They'd either be great buddies or terrible enemies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He also mentions that uh, Lord Caswell ha- has shut himself up in his castle. And Lord Caswell is Laurent Caswell, the Lord of Bitterbridge. So he's just like, I'm done with this. I wash my hands of it. I'm staying in my tower till you sort all this out. <laughs> so. But Stannis is coming. Tyrion's reaction suggests he might not have got the two weeks that he was hoping for last time. Uh, th- he does consider whether the Martells could be spurred into attacking Stannis from the south, but they conclude that that's not actually possible. Uh, so whatever this chain is, is it going to be sufficient to keep Tywin's army at bay? No, not Tywin's army at bay. <laughs> oh. <laughs> So whatever this chain is, is it going to be sufficient to protect King's Landing without the help of Tywin's army? Yes, exactly. That's the thing. Like, he sounds quite quite panicked. And I guess you would be, regardless of how prepared you felt if a huge army was yeah. heading toward your city and you have no army of your own to defend it. But, yes, uh, he he has been working on this chain. He needed two more weeks of la- at last check. But maybe that chain is just something to help them win, not the this is going to do it for us. Right, right. So So do you have some background? 
I do have a bit of background. So uh, Tom is being taken to Rosby, just up, just uh, northeast up the uh, Rosby Road from King's Landing, as we mentioned already. And Rosby is a small castle surrounded by a village, as well as orchards and fields of barley. And we learned back in Tyrion 4 that most of the food coming into King's Landing since the outbreak of the war in the Riverlands is coming from Rosby. Lord Giles is the head of House Rosby. We've mentioned him multiple times in this chapter. He's been a fixture at court since our story started. He's the one that's always coughing into a square silk at events. That's basically the description every time is in Rosby. Lord Rosby was coughing. (laughs) The house sigil is... (laughs) It has three red chevrons on a white background. And I'm not quite sure how to describe... What is it? It looks like just before before you carry on with the sigil. Right now, it sounds a lot like what he might look find in his handkerchief after <laughs> yes, he's done the coffee. A very good point. <laughs> but there's more to the sigil. Yeah. Go on. The sigil is dotted with these what I guess I would describe as like little stick figure girls. They they kind of look like scarecrows wearing a dress. It's got like little okay. arms and a little head, and then like a kind of a triangle at the bottom, okay. like a little dress that dot all over the sigil. I'm really not sure. Maybe there's a name for it. I don't know. But if it is, I don't know what it is. Anyway, mm-hmm. um, the Rosbys have been quite loyal to the crown since the first days of Aegon's conquering. Uh, not surprisingly, the lord at the time might be Lord Giles. He's old enough. Um, but the, the Lord of Rosby at the time peacefully surrendered to Aegon's sister Rhaenys and her dragon Meraxis. Big shock there. But mm-hmm. and, and since Magor the Cruel, a.k.a. Magor the Misunderstood, gets a, a reference in this chapter, I'll share a quick connection between House Rosby and the Targaryen king. A Sir Rayford Rosby defended King Magor during his trial of the Seven to decide the rightfulness of Magor's claim to the throne. Unfortunately, Rayford died during the fight. However, the Lord of Rosby remained loyal to the king throughout his reign. He was actually one of the last to see the king alive. And after Magor's death, Lord Rosby drank a cup of hemlock to join his king in death. And then the Lord's young son received forgiveness from Magor's successor, King Jaehaerys I Targaryen on Dragonstone. So I'm not alone in thinking he was misunderstood. Right. Good to know. At least Lord mm-hmm. Rosby was, was pro mm-hmm. Magor. <laughs> so comparison with the television show, this one is a bit all over the place. Shea has been working as Sansa's maidservant for a while in the TV show. So oh, right, right, right. The, the two are coming back together a little bit. She never stayed in a man. She was always in the Red Keep. Is Lollys Cersei even a character is... in the TV show? Is who? Lollys. Lollys? No, I don't think so. Okay. No, I don't think so. Because it was uh, it was Sansa that was almost about to be almost raped, raped yeah. right, and the Hound saved That's her. Right. Okay, I got it. Cersei is livid about losing Marcella, so she certainly doesn't intend to ship Tommen away too. Okay, but like you said, maybe ship him away a little bit to avoid being shipped away further by Tyrion. That does actually make a little bit of sense. But sure, certainly no discussion of that in the TV show. Uh, a little bit later in the story than where we currently are in the book. Tyrion and Varys have the conversation that they've had in this chapter, but Varys then balks at actually telling Tyrion about his castration, but says, you know, I'll tell you one day, but let me tell you, for a man in service to such powers, magic, to sit on the Iron Throne, I can think of nothing worse. So he is alluding to the story that we just heard, but that comes later in the story, and then Later still, he does eventually tell Tyrion the story, but but that's way f- down the line okay. in the TV show. All right. Uh, season three. We're still in season two. Okay, right. That makes sense because we're in book yeah. two. Yeah. Uh, Pedantry Corner, it's really odd to offer by water this lordship, but you have made me think it's not that odd. There is a reason here. He is being asked to compromise his ideals just a little bit. Yeah, it, it is a quite to take, the... to take a political side. Right. Yeah, yeah I guess so. But it is quite the carrot to be offering. Yeah. Because where do you go from right. there next? <laughs> Make right, you heir exactly. to the yeah. throne. When you wanted to do something big, yeah. <laughs> but but one thing I will say that if I was just in Bywater, I mean, even if I do feel like a kinship and loyalty to uh, Tyrion, 
any Lordship from the Lannisters feels like fool's gold. Oh, uh, yeah. Whichever one of them gave it to you, the other one is going to steal it back from <laughs> How you, many you know? times has that happened already? <laughs> right, yeah. And how precariously they're sitting on the throne right now might not matter anyway. <laughs> yeah. News and notes. News and notes. Well, I don't... We don't have, like, a, a lot of news. Um... But we're we're thinking of doing something. We've been asked a few times do it. about this. Talk about it. All right. If we talk about it on the pod, then we have to do it. Well, I guess so. So a lot of you have asked us about whether we have like a, a buy me a coffee site or, or something like that set up. And we never have. Um, but we're I, I think we're going to do it. I think we're going to set yeah, up. Let's do it. It's basically let's for tips. It. If you guys if you if you like the 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 uh, antics we put on and you're interested in tipping us we we will we will take it we do put a a non trivial amount of effort into the show <laughs> so it, it it certainly does help despite appearance yes <laughs> uh and and in other news our our merchandise site is um still cooking with gas is that a saying wow. that's uh un, that, that relates like outside of the U.S. here, cooking with gas. Cooking with gas, yeah, I think so. I, I think I probably learned it here, but I think the implications understood. All right, cool. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, go check out our um, merchandise website. It's in the show notes of this episode, and uh, see what we got going on there. And we got a review from Rob Robbie Four, yes. a podcast addict. Um, fantastic podcast for book readers. The guys go into so much detail and point out things you might have missed in your rereads. So glad they started doing Clash of Kings. Well, thank you, Rob Robbie Four. Thank you very much. And, All right, and let's just, draw the just to point out, that is this. another way that oh, um, Android listeners can leave us reviews. Podcast Addict does have oh, a review option, so you don't have to just use a podchaser.com. You could also, if you're using the Podcast Addict, app to listen to us you can leave us a review right there as well lovely but so let's conclude uh stannis stannis's plan has worked and he is free to attack king's landing but he certainly made an enemy of varus uh yeah and, and i do wonder if others in the realm will feel similarly if he tries to force this religion the, on them the only thing yes that the religion aspect true but the one thing is the magic aspect I think only Varys is aware, and it will be hard for that to become, unless he comes to King's Landing and does the same trick again. You know? <laughs> Why not? It's two Eventually, for two. Eventually, everyone's going to know. <laughs> oh, there he is again, old Shadow Stannis. <laughs> <laughs> Sending Shadow Stannis down to the coffee shop. <laughs> Pick me up a latte. <laughs> <laughs> and don't kill the barista this time. <laughs> Poor Melisande, she's exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> Can I go? <laughs> I'll get you the coffee. <laughs> uh, so Shay definitely needs to keep a lower profile. This Simon Silvertongue is going to be a loose thread. Yeah, because, I mean, Shay is Tyrion's weakness. And I'm sure it's a weakness Cersei would love to exploit if she found out about it. So... Uh, yeah, she he needs to keep that under wraps as best he can. Yeah, and uh, Tyrion needs to not hit her, not now, not ever. Yeah, but like I was saying earlier, this, and I'll put in quotes, relationship is um, is possibly starting to show some threads here. He, you, we get to hear his internal battle over the reality of the situation versus his wishful fantasy of her really loving him and really being his lady. Yeah, but then again, she probably wants that too. And she's probably, you know, her act is probably an act which she can live for the rest of her life if she gets what she wants. That's you know? true. That's true. Yeah. Although that seems like yeah. it's going to be unlikely unless Tywin has a major change of heart if he ever shows up to King's right. Landing. Right. Or if Tywin dies. That's right. If Tywin He's not a young man. dies, you know. And he's he is between the forces of Rob Stark and uh, the Riverlands, if uh, Intel is to be believed, and possibly the Reach is crushing him from the other side <laughs> right. as well. He's surrounded on all sides, it would be, we can we can but hope. So, someone to be kept safe outside of King's Landing seems like a good plan. Um, 
you definitely need to move him if Stannis wins. Rosby is convenient, so Cersei could go visit him, I guess, is part of her thinking. But right. um, what happens when Cersei finds out that her plan has been corrupted? She may not. She may, she not. Really may not. But if she does, uh, that's going to create some additional animosity here. That Not like there's yeah. not enough already between the two siblings. And where, in the name of the old gods and the new, is Littlefinger? I mean, this. The, what you were saying about the Rowans and the Oak Carts being so north, seen north of the Manda does suggest that Littlefinger is out there making things happen. But for whom? Right. That that could be good yeah, news no. that they're north of the Manda. That could be bad news, or it could just be no. It could be you know, nothing useful at all. Yeah. We we don't know yet. Yeah. But, <laughs> uh, you'd think that he would have um, sent a Raven back with some sort of status update, at least saying, "Hey, I arrived at Bitterbridge on time." <laughs> Weather's great. Had a had a really nice meal. <laughs> Wish you were here. Yes. <laughs> Think I'll stick around for a few months. <laughs> I'm in no hurry. And finally, the battle shirking Baratheon is on his way to King's Landing. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's kind of ironic that a man who has earned his reputation for by being a battle seasoned battle commander. <laughs> has been right. so uh, uninterested in actually engaging in battle here. Mm-hmm. But Tyrion does uh, seem pretty Tyrion worried. Seems... Oh, he does seem worried. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, is the chain not ready? Is it not enough? We don't know. We don't know what the chain is for. Right. And help seems far away. That's uh, Tywin's army doesn't seem close by and nobody else is going to help. Right. Well, maybe not. Maybe, maybe help is coming down the Rose Road. Right. Thanks to Littlefinger. You'd think if it was, he would send a raven ahead to say, hey, help's on the way, yet again, but... Yeah, but it is Littlefinger. Right. All right. As always, you can reach us at ghost.harrenhall at gmail.com and follow us on Twitter at Ghost Harrenhall. We're on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Discord. That's right. And if you wouldn't mind going out and leaving us a five-star rate and or a glowing review, we certainly would appreciate that. And if you do, we will try to read it, read it in a future episode. Thanks for listening. Thanks. Bye. Bye.